introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sarah St. George, um, who is um, in the Prevention Science Division of the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Miami. Um, Dr. St. George's research in general is focused on Hispanic and Latino families and looking at developing, adapting, and evaluating, and also disseminating um, multi-generational evidence-based digital lifestyle interventions. Um, and on a personal note, uh, Dr. St. George is also, during COVID, the person who I learned about quali uh, rapid qualitative research from um, and has just been an immensely helpful person and colleague um, in my work. Um, and so she was the person who I was first exposed to those ideas from. And so um, that really fostered my own rapid qualitative research. And so I have no doubt that through her sharing of her expertise today um, that others here will also be inspired as I was um, by this really wonderful resource and approach for advancing science. So thank you so much, Dr. St. George, for being here and enjoy the presentation. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you, Audrey, so much. It's nice to see so many uh, familiar faces in the crowd. And also, I hope I see a lot of new faces as well. So I look forward to meeting you personally. Uh, I'm Sarah, and I'm going to be talking to you about rapid qualitative research and implementation science. And I just want to kind of get a sense of uh, your exposure to rapid qualitative analysis. So by a show of hands, how many of you have done rapid qualitative analysis? Okay, that's a good amount. Good. So we're going to have a great experience today. So I kind of did this presentation thinking about a novice in rapid qualitative analysis, but I can dive in a little deeper, give you some tips that I've used in my own rapid qualitative research to for the, those who have already done it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And yes, these are rapids because it's rapid qualitative analysis. I had a lot of fun doing some little videos for these slides. So just, you know, pick up on little jokes throughout them. Oh, wait, why isn't it clicking? Okay, there we go. You see, the, you see how the question mark moved? <laughs> that was really awesome. Uh, anyway, so I think the fundamental reason why all of you are here at this uh, seminar, and I like to walk around, so if you can't hear me, let me know, but usually I can project. Um, this is the fundamental question that we're all here to answer. Uh, how can we translate existing evidence or innovations, as I saw the new definition for the CEPR 2.0 was, uh, into practice to accelerate an impact on population health and health equity? So hopefully, by the end of this week-long seminar, you'll be able to have the tools to do that. And I'm merely here to present another tool, which is rapid qualitative analysis. Uh, and Dr. Rabin gave me wonderful lead-in today to this, and several of you had... Um, responses that I think I'll play off of as well. So we're going to talk about uh, qualitative methods and implementation research. We'll talk about rapid qualitative analysis. We'll talk about RQA and health equity, and I'll give you some uh, lessons learned uh, about the use of RQA specifically for health equity applications. And then we're going to do an activity, and I'm going to challenge you all to actually do a rapid qualitative analysis. It'll be the most rapid one you've ever done. <laughs> So qualitative methods and implementation research. And I wanted to show you, I brought three uh, like required readings that I recommend uh, after this uh, training. So I learned that NCI actually published this white paper, uh, Qualitative Methods and Implementation Science. It's a recent publication. So they're really picking up speed. Although rapid qualitative research has been around for decades, and I'll give you a little bit about the history, really their application and implementation research has really gained steam, I think, in the last five years. So this is a white paper that NCI came out with. It's a reference is there. There's also a very nice paper um, by Allison Hamilton, which is like my, you know, my star. <laughs> I light up the star of a of rapid qualitative analysis, and I've attended um, some of her webinars, and that's how I learned about rapid qualitative before I, you know, passed it on to Audrey. Uh, and then this paper that Allison Hamilton authored, co-authored about uh, applying rapid qualitative analysis in health equity. So we got her to co-author a paper with us. So you know, my eyes lit up even more. So that was exciting. So we're seeing the proliferation of rapid qualitative methods and implementation science. But why? What does it do for us? Well, really, what it does in implementation science is answer two key questions, the how and the why questions of implementation science. And this paper by Hamilton, this is a, from the Hamilton and Finley paper in psychiatry research, 
is a really nice introduction to qualitative research and implementation science. So I recommend that. And what she talks about is the fact that usually we know the what at this point. We know the innovation. Usually we have an evidence-based approach. But how do we get it into spaces and why or why not will it work in those spaces? So this is what qualitative methods can really help us to do. And here are some implementation outcome examples on the left. So you know, we heard about a lot of these through the nice introduction to the framework, feasibility, acceptability, appropriateness, adoption, penetration, sustainability. And then here are some examples of questions that, that Hamilton applied to a, a project that they were doing in the VA. So for example, aligning those questions with those implementation outcomes. So for feasibility, how do we ensure a gender tailored collaborative care model is feasible within different configurations of primary care and so on and so forth. The different how and why questions that align with implementation outcomes. That is what uh, qualitative methods can really help you to do. So it's for discovering and documenting the context in which implementation occurs, which are sometimes on the outside of the models, so the inner setting. The environments where implementation occurs, what are the processes, um, the effectiveness of the different strategies, uh, and then as well as the relationship between theorized and actual changes uh, in, in an implementation context. There are some key elements of rigorous qualitative implementation research. And again, this is straight from Hamilton and Finley's 2020 paper. So I, I just wanna run through a couple of them. So these are things that you're thinking about when you're thinking about qualitative research and implementation, uh, uh, qualitative methods and implementation research more broadly. So the sample of participants, who are, and I like this term, multi-level members or people that you're gonna go to that are you're gonna ask the questions to. You want multi-level because you want people at different levels of an organization or people who may actually adopt or utilize whatever innovation that you're there to create. So you don't want just want to go to one person in an organization and ask them these questions. You want to think about taking a multi-level approach to sampling of your participants. Because you need to think about who support you need to actually make this happen. And usually you need leadership all the way down to people that are on the ground that are going to be implementing it. Um, your data coll collection instruments, what do you need to know? And how does your uh, conceptual framework guide it? And this young lady in the jean jacket said that, that you use it to help with your uh, question guides, right? Mm -hmm. You use frameworks to guide your question guides. So that's a great uh, thing to start with, starting with your frameworks, thinking about what the question guides are, what the questions are that map onto those frameworks. So what do you need to know? Um, and how does that map on? Thinking about the timing and data collection, when, how often are you gonna to talk to participants at the beginning, middle, and end? You know, after you do different sorts of phases of rollout potentially, what are those key moments that you wanna to talk to people? Where will you collect the data? Uh, and where will you engage the people with whom you're gonna uh, talk to? Who is gonna collect the data and what levels of training or experience do they require? I think uh, a lot of times when I come in to consult on qualitative projects, Sometimes people think, oh, well, just give me the interview guide and I'll just hop in there and ask them a couple questions and <laughs> boom, get the data, move on. But there really is both an art and a science to qualitative research. So you need to make sure that whoever the facilitators are are well trained. They know how to use reflections. They know how to summarize comments because all those, I like to call them like future gifts to myself whenever I make a summary statement or a reflection, like, oh, that could be a potential code or something that I may use for the data. So I'm really leaving little tid tidbits for myself as I move on. Um, also, you'd want to make sure they're not robots, you know. Okay, next question. Thank you for your answer. Next question. Thank you for your answer. Make sure they know that what are the objectives of the study so that they know when to keep going and when to redirect the participants. So you need people who are well trained. Um, for your recording and transcriptions, will you record the conversations? Will they be transcribed by whom? And what other forms of documentation will you have? How will you store your data? What analysis, what uh, analytic approach will you use? And of course, here today we're talking, we're talking about rapid qualitative methods, so that's what we're going to use today. Uh, how will your conceptual framework guide your analysis? Is it already guided your question guide? That's a good, uh, good start. You want to make sure you have methodological congruence, which is whatever framework you use to start the study, you're carrying that through all the way through the to the analysis process as well. And then, uh, how will appropriate protections for participants be maintained? So these are the key things to think about for a rigorous uh, qualitative implementation research. 
and we had a wonderful presentation about the framework. So this is just uh, a, a nod to the fact that qualitative methods can drive and inform that these frameworks, excuse me, can drive and inform both your data collection and your analysis uh, in qualitative uh, in implementation science. But I know, so cute. Um, time is of the essence. And what happens with qualitative research is for those of you that have engaged in it before is that it can be a very time consuming process. And when we're trying to get an innovation into a particular setting or community, we need to move quickly, particularly if it's a public health emergency or some sort of other situation that really requires a rapid, uh, rapid kind of tur turnaround time. So that's where the rapid qualitative methods come in. And so here, there are many different rapid qualitative methods. So there's radar, there's one called radar, the rapid and rigorous qualitative data analysis. Uh, there's rapid ethnographic approaches. The one that I'm gonna share with you today is the one by Hamilton and colleagues. So it's just rapid qualitative analysis. And I have some great resources for you. I think these slides are gonna be shared with you. So don't worry. But at its core, what is rapid qualitative analysis? It is an alternative, and I wanna make sure that this is clear, and at times a complement to. So it's not meant to completely replace another analytic approach. It can be done together. And only the researchers can decide whether or not they need to go back with another, another type of analytic approach behind the rapid to see if they wanna pick up on things that they may have missed during that process. So it's an alternative to traditional qualitative data analysis approach, also a compliment. It's action-oriented, team-based, that may be used when findings are needed rapidly, as is the case usually in implementation research. These are just some resources for you. So this is how I learned how to do rapid qualitative analysis. I watched that very first uh, webinar. It's a, it's a 2013 uh, rapid qualitative methods and rapid turnaround health services research. All of these webinars are publicly available. And what's really nice about it is that not only do they provide you with the slides, they also provide you with a, a cool audio mm -hmm. of the webinar to this day. So there's a really nice uh, repository of these trainings. Then in 2020, Dr. Hamilton gave an update uh, and developments on the rapid qualitative approach, also publicly available, wonderful resource. And then I, in my, actually in getting ready for this presentation, I found that there's a newer one available on the same website and it's Introduction to Rapid Qualitative Research um, and a whole resource um, by Cecilia Vizigilova, which is another big name kind of in the rapid qualitative uh, research space. So those are for you. But what are the general procedures to uh, a rapid qualitative approach? So, well, let's see. For those of you that have done it, tell me a little bit about the different approaches to rapid qualitative analysis that you've used. Yes. So I actually started with mapping the interview protocol because it just makes it easier to go through um, and identify what domains. Okay. Um, so for mine, we use the integrated sustainability framework okay. um, developed by Rachel Shelton and colleagues because what we were looking to do is to make sure that whatever we're looking to implement, the community-based organization would be able to sustain it even after you go through DM the implementation. So I was thinking about sustainability ahead of time. Okay. Um, I actually brought in one of my colleagues to train them on thematic analysis and we use thematic analysis to go through and identify um, the different buckets. And we got through like 30 interviews with like three of these. Oh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Okay, so you, you mapped on the questions to, to the construct. The construct. So we used the, basically a theoretical framework developed in protocol. And then you just dropped responses into it. Yep. Okay. I saw a hand over here. That was really a good hand. Oh, okay. Yeah, Nikki. <laughs> um, so we, I think we've taken the same approach of like using our interview guide to then create kind of like a blank summary page that then will have someone go through the interview transcript mm -hmm. and just drop any of the, the quotes or things like that that would map into those like main domain or buckets. And then we'd have someone audit that. Mm -hmm. And then we would then make sure someone else audited that process as well and then create like a matrix mm -hmm. of like 
the different domains, the quotes that were that were there. Um, very good. Yeah. So that's as she described it. So that, so I'm going to walk you through exactly those steps that Nikki mentioned. So in a traditional like thematic analysis, what you would do is maybe you would create some code, you read, reread, you know, re re you know, refresh your code, see finally where you ended up, go through, code all your data, use some whatever thing to do that. For this, first you develop a summary template, and to develop a summary template, you do map on your questions to key domains or you can just keep your actual question intact. Um, so for example, if your question is, what were the key barriers to the implementation of this, of, this, of this intervention? You would say barriers, and that is the domain for that question. So you have a kind of a domain that matches each question or that matches kind of a series of, of, of a line of questions. Then, what you do is you extract the qualitative information on this summary template that just has the domains. And I'm gonna walk you through. When you extract this information into this summary template, you usually want your summary template to be no more than two pages. Okay, so it's gonna be quick. Uh, a quick read through. If, ever, if anybody picks up that two page document, they kind of know the high points of what happened in that intervention, okay? Then you're going to populate, you're gonna take those summary sheets, I'm gonna show you, I'm just walking you through. You're gonna take those summary sheets and you're gonna create a matrix because a summary sheet tells you what happened in one interview or one focus group. It's a summary of one transfer. A matrix is a summary of multiple interviews that you're gonna be viewing all of this information at the same time, okay? So I like to call it, whenever I can teach qualitative methods, Usually I like to call it like my horizontal, my vertical analysis, which is looking into one transcript, and my horizontal analysis is looking across the transcript. So that's what this does. The summary template is vertical, looking into one, horizontal, you're looking across into multiple. So those are gonna display participant responses in the rows that correspond to your domains as columns. And then you're gonna read it, and I'll show you how I typically read these matrices to start generating tools. So let me show you what the, um, here's an example. So this is um, a program of research or a, an intervention that uh, I developed with my team. It's called Healthy Juntos. It's a digital lifestyle intervention for Hispanic parents and their 12 to 15 year old adolescents to promote physical activity, healthy eating, and get them to be at a healthy weight. And so as part of our intervention development process, we, you know, surveyed participants or interviewed them throughout our user-centered design process and asked them things like, what if any impact did Healthy Juntos have on you and your family? If you were the developer of Healthy Juntos, what changes would you make to the program? Tell me about your experience using your Fitbit. They get to use Fitbits. So then the domain that we came up with for each of those questions was impact, changes, Fitbit. Those are our domains. We could have left the questions, but those are the domains. So this is how you, you first generate domains to put into your summary template. So this is an example of a transcript summary. So this is a personal preference. I like for my domain to be all caps. And I'm like really big on making sure things look decent and presentable. <laughs> so yes, I like for my domains to be in caps. And then the summary underneath those domains is bullet points, okay? This is not full sentences. This is not full excerpts of the interview. They're key points that you're extracting from that interview that are bullet points. Depending on the investigator, you sometimes they tell you not to put quotes within the, the summary um, templates. I ask my team to put any notable quotes in there because I think the, the, the actually the longest part of rapid qualitative analysis is when you're writing the manuscript and trying to find, quote, find quotes okay. that you didn't write down before. So that takes a long time. So I sometimes like to have my team extract the quote and put a couple not notable ones in there so we can start with the summary templates and then if we need to go back to the actual transcripts themselves, we can. One note about this is that you do not necessarily need to have transcripts to do a rapid qualitative analysis. You can extract and make these summary te templates directly from the audio, okay? I would report that in your manuscript, of course, as a, just being transparent about your method, but that is possible to do. If you have a transcription company or somebody that you're working with that can turn them around pretty quickly, which there are, I usually like to have the transcript files because then it's like even easier to get quotes. But if you're going back to the audio to get quotes, then it's not rapid anymore. The, the manuscript writing is not rapid. It's a slow part of the process. The analysis part will be fast. 
So you have your domains in caps. Those, that, those are the ones that correspond to the questions I just showed you. They're bullet points, enough level of deta detail, but not too much. One to two pages. If you want your team to get some quotes, I recommend it. It doesn't have to be over the top, but just some quotes to help you for later. Then the next step is that you populate a matrix. So in the matrix, as I mentioned, each row of your matrix is going to represent a transcript or an inch, which is an interview, essentially. It could be a focus group. It could be an individual interview. Um, so each row represents an interview. Each column represents a domain. And you're essentially taking the information from your summary sheet and populating your matrix with that information. And I'm going to talk about how I use an auditing process, uh, as Nikki mentioned, to ensure a little more rigor throughout this process. So I usually have multiple people um, participate in this process. You, you need a team. So this is how you have your matrix. So now we have our horizontal analysis because we see all the questions by every single person uh, who was in your study. Then we generate themes, the light bulbs. <laughs> They're moving too. Uh, okay, so to generate themes, I'm just gonna, let me go back. I'm just gonna talk about how, how I generate themes. So what I do, uh, let me let me go back to the matrix. And I'll give some of these tips later, but why not? Let me just give you a couple of them now. So usually one of the, the recommendations is to have people who conducted the interviews be that first level of extraction onto your summary sheet. Why? Because they were there. They already have a lot of information about what happened in that interview. And so for them going through and summarizing the interview, it's going to take a little bit less time than someone who's listening to that interview fresh for the first time. So usually my suggestion is whoever, if you can, have the interviewers as your, on your analysis team, have them be the ones to make the summary template. <laughs> then I have a second person, and this is the audit process, review the summary template against the audio or against the transcript and see if they agree with the information that was extracted. If they agree, they plop it into the matrix. If they don't, they come back to that first you know, level of, of extraction, discuss it with them and decide, should we keep this in the summary template? Should we not? Uh, if they do, then they move that second person, moves it onto the matrix. If they have some sort of disagreement, then they can come to me or whomever kind of is the PI on the project and see what the, if the PI agrees. So now you have an audit process that you built into this rapid then, um, usually on the, if I'm consulting on two projects right now that are using rapid qualitative analysis, you're actually going to hear about one of them tomorrow, and that typically we're going to do today is a teaser to that project. So you're going to hear from Dr. Jill Aaron Rickne, and so she's taking her transdiagnostic evidence-based intervention called the UP. A transdiagnostic intervention is one that kind of addresses two comorbid conditions, anxiety, depression, within a singular, you know, manualized approach to treatment. And so we're actually taking this approach, which has been used mostly in clinics, out into schools, very low resource schools in Miami-Dade County. And so as part of that process, we interviewed teachers, students, parents, school administrators, and mental health providers, and did a rapid qualitative analysis with those multi-level kind of uh, community members involved. So once I get the matrix, this is usually where I step into the project as the main analyst. I will review the matrix, and usually I read it down First, I read it by column and start taking notes. And then I read it by row. Because sometimes you see kind of someone who may be a little negative Nelly. You, know? <laughs> you see that coming across. You have to know who the person is uh, and see kind of what, what they're saying across. I like to see what's happening across the domain first and what's happening across an iterative. And I use that to take notes. And it's an iterative process with notes in between. Because I have a little bit more experience generating themes, I tend to be the one to generate the first level of themes based on the matrix, and then I present them back to the team of all the analysts and the investigators. So everybody who, who did the interviews, who participated in extracting the information, and we have a, a discussion. And through that discussion, we, we you know hash things out, rename things, move things around, and finally come up with our final list of, of themes that we've generated from that rapid analysis. So now let's talk a little bit about rapid qualitative analysis and, and health equity. And the, the recommendations that, that we put forth in, in this paper were 
using our ears. Very catchy. I can't take credit for that. It was one of the students on the team who actually came up with that. And each letter of ears obviously stands for another one of our recommendations for how to make sure that we uh, address health equity throughout this process. So the E is to employ the rapid qualitative analysis to address rapidly evolving urgent health equity challenges. The second one is assuring quality and rigor throughout the rapid qualitative analysis process. The third is responding to barriers and problem solving as needed. And the last one is to strengthen community relationships before, during, and after using the rapid qualitative analysis. So I'm gonna go through each of these and kind of talk about our recommendations uh, for how to, to do this. So employ rapid qualitative analysis to address health equity, rapidly evolving urgent health equity challenges. So a little bit of history, I, I mentioned that rapid qualitative analysis has been around for decades, but really uh, it picked up steam between 2013 and 2016 in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So there's a paper that was published in 2017 that was a systematic review of the use of rapid qualitative analysis, and they found 22 articles that had used rapid, rapid analysis, 13 of which were from that reflective of the Ebola outbreak from that period. So just to show that really that was the time that, that we saw these methods being applied. Um, in our uh, paper on the use of rapid qualitative analysis for health equity, we present three case examples of how it was myself, uh, Dr. Harkness, and another one of Dr. Harkness's collaborators, how we apply rapid qualitative methods. And two of them, both of them applied it during the COVID-19 pandemic. I presented the development of a technology-based intervention as another application also for health equity reasons. Why? Because you know when we're developing technology-based interventions uh, compared to when you know they're developing them in California or companies are developing them, researchers tend to take a lot longer to develop you know technology-based interventions. But we don't have time to wait. We got to get these into the hands of end users quickly. And when we're working with software developers, I like to give my software team information on what they should be iterating quickly throughout the process rather than, oh, wait, let me do my, you know, I mean, you were speedy thematic analysis, but let me do my, you know, long analysis and then give you information on what to improve. So we don't have time to wait. We got to get this into the hands of people. So when is RQA good to use? Public health emergencies or other less obvious evolving health equity situations, like making, making timely adjustments, adjustments to interventions. And the two projects that I'm working on are both with underrepresented or low resource kind of communities that don't have access to interventions or these types of interventions because again, they're in the clinic. So we need to get them out into their hands. We need to, we need to go to them. We need to go to the people to get the innovation where they need to be. Um, so even though they're not technology-based, they're still uh, in communities that need them. Um, also to help reveal societal tensions that disproportionately impact marginalized populations and to understand a community's priorities and respond to their needs in a timely fashion. So we'll talk about the need to really involve the community in this process. You wanna ensure rigor and quality throughout the RQA process. So um, establishing trustworthiness through reflexivity. You want a big team who is usually reflective of the community that you're serving. Um, and so you need to have people who have lived, ex you don't need to, it would be, it's great, it's ideal to have people who have similar lived experiences on your team because they can really understand the data using their own lens, which may be matching what is the community's lens. So that helps in the rapid process. And you wanna make sure that the team has a little bit of time to reflect on what biases they bring to the table and how those might be reflected in their, what they're summarizing, or what they're um, populating into the matrix. So giving the team a little bit of space to reflect on their lived experiences throughout this process. You also wanna make sure that you follow an established approach to rapid qualitative analysis. This is, I think, one of my biggest pet peeves in the qualitative literature in general, is that most uh, of times that I read a qualitative paper, they talk about what they do, but not necessarily refer back to some sort of established approach. So make sure that if you're using the Hamilton approach, you're citing those webinars, you're citing the papers, if you're using radar, you cite the radar. If you're using rapid <laughs> graphics, you cite that. Um, establish a team that's committed to the project and uh, committed to also achieving equity. Um, we talked about that. Providing thorough training to all team members and team members at multiple levels experience the training opportunities to be involved. 
this is a really nice introduction to qualitative methods, usually for novice um, novices in qualitative methods, because it's so practical and kind of easy to explain and understand. Uh, in our trainings that, that, I, that I developed, you, you want to make sure that you have both didactic and hands-on components to the training. Usually, if I have new people that are doing a rapid qualitative analysis, I'll have them, I'll have the same people extract information from the same handful of interviews, maybe two, and then we'll, we'll share. Okay, what did you, let me see what you summarized, let me see what you summarized. Some of them are going to have too many bullet points, some of them are going to have not enough. So you need to be able to see the differences in, in training at the beginning so you can really correct, give like corrective feedback about appropriate level of detail, whether if you want some quotes, you put in the quotes. So you want to give them an opportunity to do that, watching the webinars and having hands-on practice to be involved in that process with the data that you're using for the project. Responding to barriers and problem solving as needed. So you wanna make sure you have a large team. Why? Sometimes you're working in an emergency situation and people may need to be taken away for their own emergency reasons. And so you wanna make, make sure that you have a, a large enough team to, to step in when needed. Um, be adaptable and flexible, especially in emergency situations or rapidly evolving situations. There's gonna be changes. There's gonna be new questions that you need to add to your guide. So you need to be able to adapt and be flexible and foster that spirit of adaptability in your team. Um, another challenge in this space, I think we're, we're starting to overcome this challenge little by little is just people not knowing about it. So when I put forth a manuscript with this rapid qualitative approach, you know, getting some people raising their eyebrows, like really, what, you know, what is this? So we need to spread information about this and make sure that we're kind of applying to small grant mechanisms to um, utilize these rapid approaches in urgent situations. Sharing these methods with colleagues. I mean, we've had a little spread here at University of Miami. I learned this about this from someone. Then I talked talk to Audrey about it. Now, you know, now I'm here speaking to all of you. We're spreading the word about rapid qualitative analysis. And then also establishing a culture of stress, uh, self-care and stress management, um, making sure that you give your team members space. Again, going back to one of the primary utilizations of this approach, which is emergency situations. You need to make sure that people are, your team is not burned out. They might be dealing with their own challenges like a COVID-19 pandemic. So you're trying to prevent burnout and take care of your team members as you're doing the work. And then strengthen community relationships before, during, and after rapid qualitative analysis. This is not really a, an approach that lends itself well to forming a community bond and then doing a rapid qualitative analysis. I mean, you can, but it's very helpful to have those community relationships established before, because then you have a partner from the beginning, you have someone who can, you know, if you want to bring them in on the process, ask them, what, what does your community need? How can I help you? You know, what information would be most helpful? What do you think is going to work? What's going to get in the way? Help, you know, help me to help, help the community. So that makes it rapid. It's going to slow you down if you have to form those relationships to then do the rapid work, but it's going to be accelerated if you have those strong relationships. Uh, and then also you show the community how this process loops back to serving their needs. Um, so that's key. And then engaging and integrating the community members in from conceptualization through the dissemination of your study findings. So are we ready for an activity? Yeah, you're so ready. Okay, so, so let me stop. Any questions before we do our activity? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So I think the, one of the most costly things is transcription. So first decide, are we going to be transcribing the interviews or not? Because that could save or you know, add to your expenses. So first decide that. I don't know if you have an established company that you work with. Um, there's also a lot of like rap rapid checks to you know page, but make sure they're already approved and hooked up. Same thing. Don't just like log on to ten and just you know <laughs> start transcribing your interviews. Okay, make sure that the university approves and that they're HIPAA compliant. So first decide: Are you going to transcribe? That's going to say. Then I think I think about you know if I have existing team members of my team that are doing the interviews, it's kind of a, already a sunk cost because they're already dedicating ten of some time. Um, but I try to think about how much additional time it's going to take them. Usually, to summarize an hour-long interview, I would say add double the amount of time 
so like two hours to transcribe an interview. I would say it's usually it takes an hour for every fifteen minutes of audio set if you're gonna have your own team members do it versus send it out. So that's usually how I think about it: an hour for fifteen minutes of audio, um, and maybe get yourself a foot pedal and stop, you know, rather than having to take your hand to the mouth to uh, cough. That takes longer. And then yeah, for summarizing an interview, I would say double to maybe three times depending on if it's the interviewer who's doing the interview, it, that speeds it up. So that's why I usually have the interviewers do it first, but double to three times the amount of time to summarize an interview. Same thing for that next person. And then the, the I think the hardest part of the process or the part that takes the longest, you want to have kind of someone who knows if possible and can train the team appropriately for that person. So I don't know if that gives you an exact number on cost, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of time. Yeah. Um, any other, yeah, gentlemen, how about you? Um, I am wondering if you have any additional considerations um, to ensure or support that the publishing is also rapid, because if we're waiting six months, um, you know, how rapid is rapid? Um, yeah, good, good question. You know, do you aim for like brief reports where perhaps, uh, you know, the peer reviews could be a little bit more expedited or how do you, you know, like, is there anything that you've learned throughout this process to um, sort of help bring in the publishing uh, interest? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So first I just want to make a, you, you raised something that, that made me think. So the term rapid is kind of relative, right? And in that last webinar that I had, the one, the newer webinar, you know, she puts a nice slide that she shows what is the time frame of rapid? Is it three weeks? Is it six months? Is it a year? You know, so it's, it's relative to the goals of the project, but it can be done as quickly as a week. In terms of publishing, I think it really is the motivation of the research team, you know, because if you're already presenting some sort of data to the community and they're getting the information to be able to use it, then it's up to you how quickly you want to get it into the scientific community and what resources you have. If you want to make it fast, what I would say is, already have like the introduction and methods written as you're collecting the interview. And then when you're done, you know, generating your theme, you know, you have someone who can write up the methods, hopefully have a team member who participated in the interviews and knows how to go back to find quotes. Again, that takes a long time, especially if you don't have transcripts. So I'd recommend someone who's very familiar with the data. Like I'm not in the project that I'm working on, that's not me. I'm more high level, like I look at, the, I generate the themes, I help them summarize them. But I, I don't know which interview to go back to to find which quote. So you need someone on the team who's really immersed in across interviews. So if you had someone who did multiple interviews, they would be the one. And then you can you know, write up a discussion. So I think the motivation of the research team is part of it. But if you want to make it happen quickly and get it out to the scientific community, it can be done. Audrey's team is super fast. Um, so I know that, that she's you know so, so prolific. And, and really uses a team to do the writing as well, and that's part of that that team base of work. Yeah. Yes. Also, like, rapid qualitative isn't that rapid. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> what you just described sounds kind of complicated. Like, how long is the? It's faster than other approaches. Yeah, yeah. But like, how long do you think it would take? Like, you go in. There's a Ebola outbreak. You interview like. 10 providers and like 10, I don't know, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. What would you say, how long would it take to get like your matrix done or, you know? Well, I think you need to be doing your summaries as you go. And I think one of the errors in qualitative research, I think is that you write these grants and you say, I'm gonna do 20 interviews and then you wait until all 20 interviews are done and then you start analysis, which is gonna be done in each round too. So what, what I would say is start summarizing those as soon as possible. My goal is usually if, if the team really wants to be rapid, I say I want all summaries done and populated into the matrix like two weeks after that final interview. So it, so then it really depends on, I don't know how quickly you recruited those 20 people, right? But if, if everything is in the matrix and summarized and then you have your last interview, you get your transcript a week later, it takes a week to get the two people, you know, it takes like a couple days, like let's give it two days if I really want a tight timeline, I'll say, okay, I want the first analyst to get this done in two days and the second analyst to get this done in another two days. So let's say a week. So then I give it another week, get all the everything done, matrix ready, and then that final review and discussion can happen within like another week or two. But there's a lot of- So if you're adapting an intervention or something for an implementation project, 
you know, you're thinking data collection two to three months, mm -hmm. the rest of it another. Like, well, I mean, you know. <laughs> do you do, is there some sort of interview process that happens before you start adapting your intervention? Like well, when usually I, these things, it's like year one, formative work, year two, start the intervention. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I hear you. Um, with Jill's projects, the one that, that we we did, let me try to think of how long it took us to do this process. I mean, it took us longer to write the paper and get it published yeah. than to yeah. do the actual work. But I'm pretty sure that we had most things done like within a month. Yeah. yeah. Again, and her team was very good. They had established partnerships in the community. They did the interviews quickly. They recruited quickly because sometimes recruitment it was is what takes longer yeah. and, and the transcription. But I think within a month we had kind of the matrix ready to go. Like a month from from, well, from that last interview, a couple weeks had the matrix ready to go, and then gave Jill some things to say. Okay, this is what you need to do because in that project, just like you said, we had first, and she'll tell you more about this tomorrow. But we had the formative work at the beginning. Then she was adapting the, the intervention for the first time, doing a case series to kind of take it out for a spin. Then doing another qualitative data collection with those people. Then we adapted the intervention another time before our RCT. But yeah, we, we had it. We had it done within a month. Yeah, it was pretty rapid. <laughs> There's also yeah. the training part. The though. training so part, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So that that was my role on the project. So I was able to provide training before data collection, then another round of training prior to data analysis, and we timed it strategically. We had the company lined up to get the transcripts already. So you do need someone if you have someone who knows and can guide you preemptively throughout the process. It helps. Because you shouldn't think of like, oh, we have all the interviews done now, let's do transcription. You gotta have a transcription company the moment you start the interview. Yeah. So is that focus group format that you did? Is it like a different like a table type of a number so you can distinguish audio streams from your interview and time? So is that approach useful here for the IDA? I don't I just want to apply it. Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um in my experience, I think a little bit of that nuance may be lost in a rapid approach, unless you strategically set up your matrix to capture some of that. But usually when you set up your matrix, at least what I've done is every row reflects one group, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you want to tell, you, you give sp special instructions that you want the comments of the people in the focus group to reflect their own row. It depends kind of what level of nuance you want. That might be a good study, for example, to do a complementary um, more traditional analysis following it, if you want them to pick up on some of that nuance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, something to add to kind of that question that we used in NYP, we used uh, Zoom, and it transcribed automatically including like everyone that's a different speaker. So you do have to go through it and, and make sure that it's correct, but it would be helpful. Um, I was going to ask if you have uh, kind of like a minimum amount of people that on your team that you would ask to kind of like, like let's say there's 10 interviews and you have five people on your team, you ask them to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Or if there's like 50 and then you have like five people. Can you just kind of like talk about that? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that I have a formula for the, like the right number of people. It depends on like how many people are on the project, you know, how many people do I want to be involved. It can be you don't want it too many people, so then it's like only everybody's only doing one interview. You want someone to have the practice of doing a couple. Mm -hmm. So if, I, I like to make sure that you know, usually if, if somebody's going to have a role in this, that they can at least extract information and or put it in the summary for at least like two to three, at least three, three interviews would be good. Because if they just do one, then you know it's going to be so different from doing like you know like that's where the training comes in. So you want them to have a hand in summarizing or extracting information from multiple interviews. So that's how I would decide. If you, it's only one to one ratio, one person to one interview, I don't think that that's a good number to start with. Like if you're gonna do a couple days, I think that's good. Okay, so let's practice so you can see how, how am I doing on time? Oh, okay, oh, 10 minute warning coming up. Okay, so for the activity, uh, so what you're gonna do, so yes, we can, you've handed out the transcripts, yeah, I'm gonna actually fill it here. Okay, so I've handed you, uh, Two interview transcripts. You each have two, right? Or just one? Two. Okay, good. And you're going to work in pairs. 
to develop a summary template, extract information for only two of your domains from that summary template. Don't worry, I have another handout that's gonna help you think a little bit. <laughs> and then you're gonna populate a matrix for only two of your domains. And we're gonna debrief, but wait, let me show you what the interviews are. So I decided to be a little innovative and I asked ChatGPT the following prompt. I said, Generate a short interview transcript interviewing a teacher related to her feedback on implementing a clinic-based mental health program within schools. This is a little teaser for Jill setting her up for tomorrow. And so this is what I got. <laughs> then I said, thank you. I thanked ChatGPT. I just want to point that out. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. It was kind of a kind of gut instinct. But I said, thank you. Can you generate another version of the same interview with the same questions asked, but with a different respondent? And ChatGPT generated transcript number two. So these are very like basic interviews. I just want to know that they were generated by ChatGPT, but still very cool uh, that, you know, that here we are. So you're going to read those two. And oh, sorry, no, I didn't give you, I, I should have showed that. So I want you to repeat these, and as you're going through, look at the questions, and think about, like, I'll do this first, what domain might you have for your summary template first? So work with a partner, read our chat GPT interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things that sometimes that's why I did it to the end of the CA. I am the only Yeah, I mean, people, but we didn't know how to count. 
Okay, tell me, tell me what some of, let's stop there for a second. So tell me what some of your domains were. Did they look like this? Ish? Yes. Yeah. I mean, they don't have to be these, right? It does not have to be exact. But this is an example of a all right, so now let me see what this is. Yeah, so now I, I'm so happy if there's this money in this. Um, okay, so now, now they're handing out a uh transcript summary that I generated for you. Um and so this is what you would put together once you have your domains. This is what it would look like, your transcript summary, okay? So I just put the ones that I had here. Maybe the domains were slightly different, but that's fine. And so now what you can do, and I know there's not a lot of space here. I, I envision that maybe you were going to access these electronically and populate them, but we're going with paper version for today. And so now you're going to put actual information from your interviews. So maybe, I don't know if we have enough, Yaniki, but maybe can we do two or five minutes? Okay. Yeah, two per, per, per team. So now work on extracting information uh, from your summary template or into your summary template for only two of your domains. Yes. Yeah, only two. Whatever you like. You're only going to do two domains for the sake of time. So choose two domains and populate the information for each interview. So we have to just write the information for the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
It would be ideal to, to, to for one of you to do number one, one two, uh, exactly. but you can do a line here, okay, how are we doing on time? Good. Okay. I think I didn't explain this as well as I could have. Ideally, you're extracting information from one interview here and another one on the other sheet. Remember, each summary template corresponds with a single interview. Okay, good. But if you made a mistake, that's great because you learn and you won't, you won't do it again. Okay, let's pause here. So, so now what you've done is you've generated your domains. Let's review based on the questions that were asked. Time's up, but now it's the Q&A portion, so we're good. Um, then you have generated your summary template, which is this, and you have gotten people on your team to extract information from your interviews with each interview corresponding to a single summary template. Okay. The next step is to create your matrix. And so what you would do is you're going to then take your summary sheets and you're going to populate the matrix with that information. Some people ask me, do I put exactly word for word the bullets from the summary template into the matrix? Usually, yes. Um, or do I streamline it further? You can also do that if you would like to. Um, but it depends on, you know, if, if, if I see that the, this is part of the training of the team, that the summary template should really reflect high level points um, that then you populate into your matrix. Okay, so then here we have always the matrix. 
uh, along each row is reflective of a different interview. And then each uh, column is reflective of one of your domains. So then you populate your matrix in this way. So I don't need you to necessarily, you know, generate your matrix right now, unless you kind of, you want to, I see you like so excited, like you want to, you want a matrix, <laughs> you want a matrix. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about, you know, just debrief on this experience for you. So tell me a little bit about questions or thoughts. Yes. Why do we need a transcript summary? Can we just skip all that initial individual teamwork, identifying this domain through the matrix? That's a good yeah. question. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you do the same? Go ahead. No. When I did it, I, you said so many pieces up, like, yeah, now we went right to the matrix. So I'm um, sorry for like yeah. being exact, but that's what my team did. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. And I think that I like to have, um, it depends how big you want your matrix. If you want that level of, further kind of collapsing, then you want to make sure the summary provides you a, a little bit more detail than the matrix might have. If you're going to be very rich in detail, it becomes harder to read the matrix. So that's one reason why you might want a summary. The other reason is that um, if you decide to add some little quotes, you would only have them in the summary template and not necessarily have them in the matrix. Um, so those are, I think, are, are the main reasons to want to it also creates kind of a clear way to audit from one version to the next. Yeah. So you have, if you have one person doing one and a second person doing the matrix, it's easier to see where the changes are. And you would lose that uh, ability yeah. to track if you just went straight to the matrix. Yeah. I'm sorry, just kind of add this. So we skipped the, the summary sheet but we had columns in there so people can put the quotes so that okay. it would make it easier. We just made the matrix so that we could have what the, you know, what they were pulling out, what they saw, and then had the, whatever the, the quote was that coincided. So when it was time for us to write up the result, like everything was just quick, but we skipped this section. And what we did was we actually, the summary, we used that, we actually summarized that in creating an executive summary that we gave back to our community partners, mm. right? Because they need that information in order for them to do work and they move much quicker than, you know, yeah. than academics. Yeah, you could add another quote. I just wonder, did you add it like behind every domain? Yep. Oh, okay, so you have general thoughts quotes, benefits quotes, student yep. response quotes. Okay, that's another way you could do it. Yeah, that, that certainly is one. You mentioned a summary row. So um, one thing that I didn't mention that I have done on my teams is, for example, if I have multi-level stakeholders, I add an additional row that's a summary. So if it's like teacher one, two, three, four, five, then I say teacher summary row. And I, I get someone else to like a postdoc on the team or someone else who's trying to train in these methods to summarize what the teacher stated in one row. Then I do the same thing. I don't do that if the stakeholders are different, the, the community member types are different, I don't mix them. But that way I can see like, you know, where teachers might have said something different from students and parents. So I do add a summary row in that way, summarize the comments from that particular community member. And then, you know, in this project that I'm gonna talk about, that I talked about with Jill, we had like five or six people per, per different community member type. So it was a lot of different information. And when I got comments on the manuscript, Although my themes were kind of reflective of the entire body of interviewees, they wanted me to um, report who endorsed each of the themes from the rapid analysis. So I actually added that to the table. And it was really nice to see because each theme was reflective of at least three community member types feedback. Um, and they could see that. So that's another way kind of to do it. Other questions? The most elusive part of this process is the part of generating themes. And this is, again, it really takes a, a bit of expertise to do this part. And how I do that is, like I mentioned, I go down and read all the general thoughts, write down some notes. I go all the benefits, write down some notes. I go all the students. That doesn't mean that there's going to be a theme per question. And that's often like a, a novice uh, qualitative researchers are trying to generate one theme per question type. The theme is facilitators. And then each facilitator is a sub theme. 
that's usually not how I, my style of like generating the theme. But if again, if you're mapping it onto some sort of implementation framework, then that does make sense for this. So uh, this goes back to the use of that framework and, and how those domains may map on to the framework. No, um, I can give a sample of a matrix if I want to on a paper. Usually I don't. Usually I just present the theme, like a more traditional qualitative paper. I have the theme title and then the theme passage that includes, uh, you know, illustrative quotes uh, in the theme passage. No, unless, unless you know, unless I think that's a little bit too much level of detail um, for the, the reader and I want them just to kind of get the, that's the saddest part of qualitative research to me is you like, you become one with the people, you have all this rich information and then a whole theme is summarized in three senses. You know, the person that cried during your interview, you can't. It can't be captured in a paper, but that's, it is what it is. So thank you all so much.